Okay, thank you so much for all of your engagement so far in this class. It's been extremely impressive. Um, you're all thinking very deeply about these concepts, and I'm very excited to be able to uh, go over some of your work with you together so that we can think about uh, this idea that the judiciary, which more commonly known as courts, and of course we're also talking about the judges, and I'm kind of playing there a little bit just to help you remember from the reading with Foucault where he's talking about you know, where are the chairs set up? Where's the desk? How does that separate the judge from, you know, the audience or the people in the uh, room who are defending themselves or the lawyers, right? There's all these different roles. We're going to get to that a little bit later uh, in the six-week course, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there is what we're trying to do then is that uh, people from different perspectives are, of course, going to have a different idea of what justice is, and this is what we mean by popular justice, right, or common justice. Uh, or middle class justice. Um, but what I want you to see through the readings is that that shifts and changes over time. So what's popular, uh, and, you know, think about popular culture, right, pop music, something like that, uh, is not consistent uh, among all groups in all geographic areas or across time. Uh, and so how could this um, be compared to the more bureaucratic, what Foucault calls the bourgeois, uh, form of justice, but you know, I like to think of it more as middle class justice, or you might even think about it professional middle class uh, justice. And so we want to compare these these ideas. Uh, but before we get into the middle class or the bourgeois bureaucratic justice, uh, I really wanted to see uh, what were your ideas about what justice is, how do you find that information, and what access do you have. So we just want to kind of think about the main point here are the different stories about law. And when we refer to different stories, we're going to be talking about narratives. I saw a couple of you actually use the word narratives, which is lovely, right? It shows me you're on, on the same page here. Uh, and then when we talk about law, we mean legality. I say this because oftentimes in my classes over the last 13 years with students at Kingsboro, uh, law can mean a few different abstract things to students. Oftentimes, uh, it means police. Uh, and usually police not as people, uh, not in costumes. Um, not even in their duty as in, you know, walking the beat or in their cars or using the phones that I see all of them on these days. Uh, but it's more about uh, the police in action of arresting someone, detaining them, uh, or harming them or killing them, right? So there's an action uh, related to law connected to the police. That's a large percent. I say about 60% of students over that time. This is what they mean when they say law. Now, some students are thinking about a little bit more politically, and so they think about the concept of order, uh, and they'll tend to say things without law, there would be no order. So some of these students tend to talk about movies like The Purge. Um, and so they're really talking about a very abstract, almost mythical kind of belief, um, where uh, believing in things, so like thinking about Santa Claus, if you believe in Santa Claus and you live in a community, right? obviously somebody has to dress up like Santa Claus for the kids to maintain that belief structure. So here it's similar. So if you believe in this idea of without law, there would be chaos, then you have to be in a community where everybody believes that's for them to actually implement it. I just bring up those two examples, um, and I'll bring up a third one actually that's more of an older Anglo-Saxon concept, which law was uh, restrictions on government, uh, the naturalist position of uh, limiting what the government can do, or quote unquote, small government. That's a, that's a third, what we call narrative about law. And so when we're talking about these different competing uh, or overlapping stories, we're going to use the phrase legality. So we've got legality narratives when we put them together. Now, when we put all this into more fancier academic language or textbook language, uh, it's polyvocality of legality narratives. So you've got the legality narratives. Now you're probably wondering polyvocality. It's kind of a fancy way of saying different stories about legal narratives, right? Um, but the concept polyvocality uh, is linked to a more Roman concept uh, of the idea of Polybius, right? Out of many voices, we are one. That's actually one of the mottos of the United States. Um, and so here we're saying um, two things, is that in any given room, especially in a, a room in New York City, you're going to have uh, many different voices, many different ideas about what law or legality is. And those all operate, they're all true, they're all right, because they all operate at the same time and people are um, you know, working them out. If I'm in a smaller town, um, or if I go into a very small family uh, in New York City, right, there's less likely to be that polyvocality. There's usually going to be kind of one 
dominant or and by dominant right can mean it's always followed or it can mean it's violent or a threat of violence um, there's usually one dominant narrative that everybody kind of pretends to follow or they you know you're going to suffer the consequences so we want to think that's not really how it works in the courtroom there's not one dominant narrative now there is what we want to call uh, a hegemonic or dominant narrative but it's not doesn't have that quite of that power it's kind of more of something that people just take as common sense until they start actually thinking about the issues and then they start to question that common sense uh, version of legality. I, I tend to think about it, it's the story we tell little kids uh, about the law and the legal system uh, and you just didn't get a lot of chances to question that story, um, especially in classrooms. Uh, you might have probably questioned it through watching TV or taking out with your friends or the many acts of rebellion that teenagers go through. Um, but you hadn't thought about challenging, you know, an entire system of, of a narrative of law that was really not real, but it was there to kind of give something, you know, give kids something to start learning about what order is. And so the other way to think about it is that you've had multiple ideas about legality throughout your life. And so you can start to think, OK, I have five or six probably ideas about what I think legality is, and it might conflict. They might be contradictory. They might be hypocritical. In fact, they probably are. Uh, and you can't always resolve those contradictions or fix those uh, mistakes. And they're kind of always in your head and they kind of get triggered when you're in a situation. So the idea here is just to remember there's not one story. Law is not one thing. Uh, so what I did was I started with your uh, discussion board responses and the annotations that you uh, provided, the comments you provided about the, the reading. Uh, and what I did was called a, a data, it's called data mining. Uh, I, I used the computer to extract those comments. I then put it into a software program, uh, which allows me to start looking at the, uh, the big kind of picture of what you're saying together as a class. What's the story that's told by this particular class, which I've been doing this for a couple of years now. And so each class will have a different story uh, about the concepts. Uh, but then it also kind of lets me know what are the major themes uh, what are some of the questions that you're looking at? And then I start getting a little bit more deeper into and looking at the one at one at a time uh, examples. And so I like this because it allows me to better figure out where you're at and how I can respond and give you videos like this, assignments, um, extra credit, right? There's lots of different ways I can kind of uh, intervene if you're struggling or give you enrichment opportunities if you want to kind of take these ideas to the next level. So I want to start with this, this uh, quote, which I'll probably let her uh, take credit for it if she wants to. Um, but I really I really love this, right? So so when she got into the reading, she was very active and had lots. I mean, it's really a great example of how to show a dialogue between the reading and the person reading it. Um, but I thought this is great because this is really ideal uh, as you're kind of putting through your annotations that at some point, like let's say it's the seventh annotation, could be the third one, might for some of you by the, the ninth or tenth one, uh, that you've started interacting with it so much that you kind of say, okay, this is the thing that captures for me uh, what the reading is about. Um, and so it's interesting because in this uh, framing, uh, it's taking action against what's called the people's court uh, as something that's equal to um, a, a real sense of justice or a best sense of justice or the you know, um, highest form of justice. Uh, he's arguing that this isn't really actually, first of all, it's not actually an ideal form. It's the, an ideal form of justice, of course, would be no violence, no conflict. Uh, there'd be no issues, right? That, that would be the ideal form of justice. Or as Rodney King said, why can't we all get along? That would be the ideal form of justice. Uh, so, so we already have this problem if we're coming together and having a court to judge people for injustice, right? So, so we have to be careful not to think that just coming together and yelling at people or having them argue with each other or throwing rocks at them, right? Uh, th th that's not necessarily the ideal of justice. And so we might even be slow uh, to think about um, what it is that's happening instead of just assuming that it's justice. Uh, and so this is then contrasted to other ways, right? Other forms of struggle that people engage in. Uh, like three of you in the discussion board talked about labor struggles. What, what a great example, right? There's labor struggles that have really nothing to do with a people's court or throwing up a table and having people argue on two sides. Uh, it's much more difficult, right? They, they, they are really, there's a lot more going on. I've been involved in labor unions a long time and they're, there's, they're fascinating if you start um, 
you know, really paying attention, one of the students pointed out that people can literally lock themselves in a room uh, on one single point uh, to, to make sure that they come to some agreement or know that they can't. Uh, and then in that case, they have to strike. I mean, very, very interesting form of form human organization. Um, so the, the quote goes on to then talk about uh, this idea of legitimacy uh, and be careful with that idea too, because of course it's the upper middle class, the professional class, uh, the wealthy, the elites, the well-educated, uh, those who are judges, those who are university professors such as myself, uh, that tend to talk of, you know, we tend to tell the story about what justice is, right? We're the ones who write the textbooks, we make the ch court decisions, we argue the cases, we do the research. So those could very likely be different uh, between the working class ideas. Now, I grew up in a working class family, but I often find myself, you know, having these conflicting values, these professional values versus these uh, working class values. And so, you know, you, you got to start thinking about how these uh, narratives can kind of go up against each other and how they might influence people who maybe don't have as much time. Uh, I get paid to reflect and think about these things, right? Imagine uh, how that's difficult to do uh, if you have more you know, obligations at work that don't allow you to stop moving, for example, uh, or if you have home care ob obligations that you're constantly attending to. Um, you're going to have a different sense of justice that's going to be built ag against those experiences. That's the, the nutshell, and I think uh, this student did a great job um, of kind of highlighting where, where we're at with this concept. So what I did then was, uh, you know, I wanted to highlight then how this could, could work for as, a, as an enrichment opportunity. So uh, a lot of you, uh, several of you, were really interested in this kind of uh, internal strike that women participated in um, and the kind of social norms that existed during the Nazi occupation of France uh, before and during World War II. Uh, and so one way you could, could take that to the next level, uh, several of you had questions about it, um, the, you know, that is a great research project, as professors I had used to say. Uh, so I wanted to show you how you do it. So you go to the Kingsborough website, kbcc.cuny.edu. Uh, over on the right-hand side, you, you click this, those three bars, and you go down to Quick Links. Quick Links takes you to the library, from the library, you then search for what's called JSTOR, J-S-T-O-R. It's very common uh, research tool used in the social sciences and criminal justice and political science and law uh, education, right? There's lots of different practical applica applications, social workers. Uh, and, you know, all I did was I put in our search terms, right, based on the questions you were asked. And there are over 70 publications uh, that are not people's opinions from the internet, uh, but academic researched and checked peer reviewed, meaning somebody else has gone to make sure that the information is valid, right? That the sources they use are real sources and not something that a computer hallucinated. Uh, and so then you can read those articles and learn more uh, that, and usually they kind of tend to have titles that answer uh, your question. And so uh, as you can see in this first title is that the crime of rape is actually uh, a big part of this uh, internal strike and the social norms that developed from it. So I wanted to give you that kind of uh, tool uh, and I'll do what I can to try to provide more resources for those of you who ask questions. But as you'll see later, there were a great number of questions. Uh, another question that came up was this, uh, which is not just a vocabulary word, it's a Latin philosophy um, that is central to legal reasoning. Um, and really, if you want to understand criminal justice, I think you really do need to understand this concept, although you're not, it's not a concept that you might understand immediately. Um, but this idea is, you know, it's, it, let me put it this way, is you don't want to be accused uh, of having uh, a, a prior justification for your assumption. So uh, I'm going to get to this a little bit later, but let me give you an example. Um, if I look through uh, some of the things that, that you said in the discussion board, for example, uh, you know, one of you was interested uh, in um, the idea that the wealthy through advertising firms uh, can, your, your quote was, um, shape narratives, manage reputations, and manipulate, manipulate the media. Those three claims are testable. We can go out and collect evidence to see if that's true. And of course, other people would probably gain evidence that suggests it's not true. So it would be an interesting uh, dialogue to figure out whether it is true. Uh, but 
until you do that, you can't make a prior justification claim to that to that form of knowledge, right? You're you're saying this is true, but you don't you didn't show us at all how that could be true. Uh, and of course, there's millions of instances in which it's not true. Uh, the educational environment, first and foremost. I mean, we are literally trying to brainwash you every day, right? Here's this information you want to learn. I'm trying to help you understand it. You had a reading, maybe you didn't quite understand it, so then we have a conversation, we have a discussion board, we have a lecture, right? Uh, so you have to ask yourself, how come it doesn't work? Well, this is going to get back to the polyvocality of narratives, right? You, you have different ways of talking than I do, and that's different than the academics, and that's different than lawyers and judges, right? So there's this kind of, you can be influential over somebody's brain, um, but, you know, you're not going to take it over. That's over-determinative. You're, you're over-determining the power of advertising. It's not to say it doesn't have any influence. It does, uh, but it's not the only part of the game. Uh, so if I try to figure out, you know, why the student was asking this question, and I look at the other highlights that other students made, um, you know, if we compare the French Revolution uh, with the Revolution China, which is the whole kind of idea here in this reading, is that, the question that kind of historians ask is, uh, how come in the French Revolution, um, the form of people's justice was to go ahead and execute everyone uh, who were no, quote unquote, known to be criminals, right? So it was common sense they were criminals. There was no trial. Uh, they were just, they were the enemy, right? So if you think of uh, executing your enemy in war um, or killing your enemy in war, uh, but in the Chinese Revolution, people actually went out of their tr out of their way to set up courts uh, and try people before they executed. They still executed them, but before they executed, they put up a, a court. And so Foucault is just largely interested in this. Why, why does one group of people at a different point of history uh, respond to the same situation differently? Um, you know, I guess the the common or the 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 the, the kind of example we could use today would be the insurrection uh, by Trump supporters. Uh, you know, why, why even bother with a trial, right? In, in the French Revolution, they just would have been executed. Um, although I kind of probably have that backwards. I think the similarity would actually have been if the Trump supporters insurrection would have been victorious, what did they say? They said they would hang Mike Pence, right? No trial. Uh, they were there to commit violence, right? So that, that is an example of popular justice similar to that of the French Revolution. Uh, and you'd have to, again, probably do your historical readings on what was the French Revolution, right? But they executed pretty much everybody on spot. Um, but in this American case, they were unsuccessful. But you could also look at the Civil War, right? That's another example of popular justice where they're just executing their enemies. There's no, they don't decide that they're going to arrange the tables, put on a wig, have somebody wear a robe, right? Form the thing into arguments, right? They, they, that's not how they organize. Um, so we can't assume that human beings' natural disposition or, you know, little kids are going to go set up courts, right? We can't assume that. We have to assume that there must be many different ways uh, of people who are engaged in a military struggle uh, or a power struggle will organize to try to resolve that conflict. Uh, so I kind of wanted to throw out then this kind of often misquoted uh, phrase, uh, students love to say history repeats itself, and, and to a certain extent that's true, right, because you're a student. Uh, but for, for those of us who have read history, uh, the phrase is, you know, basically, I've paraphrased it a little bit just to make it a little bit more updated language, because it's a very old uh, saying, which is kind of ironic. Um, those who don't know, and it's their history, because you can't know all history, right, are doomed to repeat it, right? So if you don't know something, then you're more likely to be caught up in it. If you know something about history, you're less likely to repeat it. You're, you're going to intervene. You're going to try to change things, right? I think um, Back to the Future is like the best example of, of the two problems there, of trying to change uh, history. Uh, and it does work sometimes, but it also sometimes doesn't work the way you had planned. So you changed history, uh, but it didn't work out the way you thought it was going to work out. Um, I just wanted to kind of point that out because then when you see these exchanges, um, you know, you're, you're, you're showing here that you're able to engage in a historical analysis uh, with two historians. And so you've probably had some history classes, and so the elements uh, are starting to come together. Uh, and you're starting to see the comparisons and the similarities and differences uh, between 
epochs, right, between historical periods where human beings are more or less facing the same challenges, but they respond to them differently. Uh, so the only thing we really repeat uh, are the obvious things, right? We live and die. Uh, we're competing over resources, although there's a plenty of examples in human history of people cooperating uh, over those with those resources. Um, but there's certain narratives or stories that we tell that repeat as well. So uh, I like how this student on the bottom uh, noticed how the methodology, right, the ways of uh, looking at the situation uh, can also be used today in the army, during the periods of colonization and in prison. You could also even say in schools. Uh, and I think hospitals, right, Foucault is, has looked at a number of places using the same method, uh, including the court system, uh, the prison system as well. Now, I want to just pull out some of the loves, right? There, there were uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of annotations, which is great. Uh, I just want to pull out some examples. Um, you know, I, again, this is a offertory uh, history, doesn't speak much of the judicial system. I mean, that's pre-existing knowledge that's not known to me. Uh, I, I've got lots of history books that does speak uh, a lot about the judicial system. So I think, you know, be careful when you're making your claims, right? You could say something like, I haven't read much history that talks about the judicial system, right? That, that is true, right? right? Uh, but, but, you know, the universal statement here is what we're trying to avoid. Um, and I think you'll see the opposite statement, right, in the next one, is that this student is now actually interested in learning more about the history of judiciary, which at, the, at John Jay, uh, College of Criminal Justice, as a junior, you could take that class. Uh, as well as other institutions also have that class. Um, I think it's interesting that some of you have been able to point out uh, some some great uh, facts, right, about the criminal justice system that, um, you know, now, maybe, you know, hopefully you knew before and now you definitely know. Uh, the court system is really just one part of the prison industrial complex. Um, you know, they have violent and nonviolent offenders, unwealth offenders, children offenders, women offenders, right? There's lots of, lots of complexity within the system. Um, you know, and we, we're going to get to this idea of vigilante justice, I think, quite a bit in this class. It seems like this group is interested in it. Uh, and also of conspiracy theories, which try to remember in law, we define a conspiracy as two or more actors who are conspiring to commit a crime. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, the playbook uh, for the dominant class, right? So I think now we're getting to that idea of um, a narrative or a story that, that tends to make it harder uh, for people uh, who are out of power to challenge those ideas. Uh, and I think it's a good way to think about it as a weapon or a tool uh, that's used by people as if we were in a game. Uh, I, these are surprising to students. I think it's true. You know, you say, why is it surprising that no institution is truly neutral? It's because some teacher or the internet or a movie told you that it was neutral. <laughs> um, so it's surprising to find out that those things are not true. Um, you know, it's interesting to set up, right, that the court is not an example of popular justice, right? It's an opposition to popular justice. Um, there are just so many examples and movies that are just swimming through my head right now. I'm trying to avoid the, the early Westerns because I'm not sure everybody wants to watch those. Um, but those are great examples of popular justice and courts being in very constant contradiction almost in every movie or TV show. Uh, I'm thinking also um, a lot of sci-fi and kind of apocalyptic movies usually have courts being in... in, in contradiction to popular justice. Um, if I think of more, I'll try to mention them as we go. Um, it is funny to think about it at one time in medieval history, the judicial system were made up of nobles and we still treat them that way. We, we, we treat them the same way as we treated lords and bishops and whatnot. Um, kind of interesting there that there's still kind of this feudalistic uh, shadow, you might call it. Um, and, you know, I think this, you know, students are usually thinking that the courts are separate from the economic system. Uh, at the end of the constitutional law class in, in my class, you learn that not only are they not separate, that the whole point was to protect the economic system. Uh, the framers of the legal system, that was their job. That's what they were supposed to do, uh, largely because they were competing with the British economic system. And so they wanted to protect their economic system against it. Uh, and I think, you know, the idea of people um, trying to organize, not organizing, some do, some don't. Um, you know, I think a lot of men I grew up with 
uh, in the 1990s really did see our choices as either going to prison, um, usually not first, right? Usually you join people who are trying to make money a way that is not always legal. Um, I could go through examples, but uh, many of those things are, are no longer illegal today. So that's interesting. Gambling, uh, marijuana, etc. cetera. Uh, joining the army. Many of my friends joined the army because they didn't think they had any other options um, or becoming police officers. Less so on the West Coast, even though they're much better paid, um, but still a significant number. Um, I think many of us also thought we'd become professional athletes, but this was, you know, the 90s. So everybody thought they had a chance. Um, so you've learned some terms, counter justice. You see some nice responses here. Uh, this idea, the army must have a deficit of soldiers for them to recruiting criminals. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric about undocumented immigrants being criminals. So you might look into see whether someone can join the military to avoid being an undocumented immigrant. Um, don't think about just recruiting criminals as in going to prison and pulling criminals, but think about it more in the sense of going to uh, Ivy League schools, uh, like white collar crime, right? People who are committing white collar crime, you can recruit them to join for, you know, cyber uh, attacks, things like that. So don't just think about it as violent crimes. Um, but also think about the fact that the army has a deficit of soldiers uh, today and not just in the United States, but in many of the adva advanced economic uh, states. Um, I think also like students who are starting to be able to make comparisons between now and then that, you know, um, People I know who teach history classes would love to see that. Uh, there's quite a bit of anger um, about the ideas of popular justice, and I, I understand that, um, but it doesn't change the reality of it, right, that, that these are still real just because you're angry with them. Um, I do want you to think about where that anger should be uh, put, right? What should you do uh, with that anger? Um, so I did want to pull out a couple examples um, that people start to see that, you know, often the anger is directed to the fact that not everybody gets the same middle class justice, right? And so because of that, I think a lot of you point out in the discussion boards, that's why people do take the law into their own hands was your was your common phrase. Um, and so you can see that's largely because middle class justice mostly serves upper middle class people. Uh, and you saw that the wealthy tend to avoid the upper class, middle class justice system altogether by simply just buying their way out. Um, the people who are supposed to be neutral, the ones maintaining domination. So it's great, right? Because the first part of that is ideal. Uh, and the second part of it is real. So you're seeing how there's a contradiction between what we wish things were, and how things really are. Um, and this is just such a fascinating question, I wanted to pull it out something for all us. Let's all think about this. Uh, in this class is, does this inequality between working class, undocumented immigrants, people of color, right, people who are, are not positions in power and domination, um, does this create uh, resentment uh, from not just those groups, which, you know, that's the obvious one, right? Although I would say, isn't it interesting how some of people in those dominant groups aren't resentful uh, of the prison law, of criminal law? Um, but of the of the of the working class, middle class, right, of the people who are in between working class and middle class, who are maybe thinking they're on their way to upper middle class, or, or one member of their family will be in the professional uh, class, do do they feel any resentment about this criminal law system and the inequalities, right? That's it's a very, very interesting question we should think about. And what evidence we can find to, to answer the question. Uh, and then lots of people were interested in the complexity of the legal system, uh, how it's unfair, uh, the, the mistakes that are made, um, how you learned through history, uh, how you were comparing to other, other uh, historical moments. And so um, I, I encourage you to look especially at those uh, annotations um, as they're very, very insightful. Uh, I also uh, wanted to pull out some of the uncoded um, it's easier for me if you code, if you put your code before, um, if you have a code, if you have a code problem, if you don't like the codes, I think there are two ways you could do it. You could put, uh, you could make up a code. So love actually was invented by students a, a couple semesters ago. Um, or you could put 
you know, N, like no, <laughs> no code. Uh, it just helps me uh, sort out the information. Um, otherwise, you're giving me a good three hours worth more work um, because you didn't put a letter in front of your uh, comment. Nonetheless, I wanted to make sure I got them uh, included. Um, so I separated them and pulled them out uh, and then just put some here as examples. Um, and I do like that these are dialogical, right? So they, they are in the form of as if you were having a conversation uh, with the reading, the author, or a group of people. So that's a great practice. Um, and I look forward to seeing more of that on the discussion boards, especially. Um, I think a lot of you were able to see um, how there's kind of this, this push and pull in our society uh, with popular justice and uh, how that hasn't really been resolved. You know, I, I, you might think about how uh, the West, in particular, France, Germany, England, the United States, Italy, uh, I guess I should include Spain, um, you know, these, these cultures uh, tend to have a belief in the middle class system, but then they celebrate popular vigilante and other forms of justice in their media, art, uh, popular culture, right? So I want you to think about that contradiction. Um, and I think a really great example um, are sports, where sometimes there's encouragement of violence and then other times there's discouragement of violence. Uh, and how we kind of go in between those two points. Um, and you might like, I like this, uh, it's okay to disagree politely. And I, I wanted to pull that uh, here. So you've got one student say they agree, uh, but then a student, another student says, wait, you know, you're saying that people involved in the court like judges and others might have different beliefs, but they usually work together on some things. Even if they don't agree on everything, they can still be fair when it comes to making judgments about different issues. This shows that even in a legal system, people can put aside their personal opinions to make sure things are fair and just. Now, is this pre-existing knowledge about human behavior? I think so, right? Um, I don't want to give up on this idea. I think it is possible because, for example, families can come together around the dinner table and come to agreement. It doesn't have to be one person making the rules all the time. Um, I think the difference would be, you know, what if what if mom put on a judge's robe every time there was a conflict and you had to rearrange the furniture and you had to write, after a while mom might start to think a certain way that's less like mom and more like judge. And so the bias is not that they're against other people, it's just that they're biased towards being in a robe and thinking a certain way. And so they don't think the ways that the people in the courtroom do. That's the bias. It's important to understand that there's two forms of bias that we're worried about, right? One is the bias that we all have because we can only make decisions based on what we know uh, and how we feel. And that's necessarily gonna be different than other people. You can't help that bias. You can, you can try to limit it, uh, but basically that just means you have to be aware of it and communicate your bias. Uh, I think this because I'm a man, maybe a woman would think differently or somebody who's transgender might think about it even more differently, right? Or maybe exactly the same, right? I just can't assume uh, without collecting some evidence or talking to somebody else um, that I already know. Uh, the other idea then though is this idea that, that judges might or lawyers might go out of their way to be biased. So they might be aware of their bias and instead of trying to limit it, they actually try to push it down further. I think the Trump lawyer in New York is a very good example of someone who is doubling down on their bias and trying to do it because they get a lot of social media attention and they get more money. And so I think if you're asking why would a person be biased in a courtroom setting, that's a pretty obvious answer is it? it's, it's money. Uh, it could also be prestige, right? They're seen as having more influence, they're more powerful. Um, so I would, I would hesitate to believe that you wouldn't do the same thing uh, in that situation. I try to walk a mile in the other's shoes about all the temptations there would be uh, to use my bias to my advantage, especially when a lot of you are saying that that's what people do. <laughs> um, but somehow you think that lawyers and judges, I guess, aren't people. Um, it does raise a fascinating argument. Like, let's go back and assume for a second that this person's absolutely correct, that the legal system could be neutral. It does put an interesting argument about whether there could be a neutral AI or a neutral algorithm that could solve these conflicts and remove the humans altogether. Uh, it is, it's worth thinking about, uh, and lots of smart people are thinking about it 
uh, today. Um, I, I'm a little confused by the last uh, example. I actually think, um, you know, an article of an inmate who spent five years digging a tunnel to end up only in the guards room is not a very good example of a legal system that works. Uh, it's just an example of somebody who would have been better off taking geology and geography classes in high school. Um, and so I'm not sure make sure that when you're using an example that it, it supports your argument. Um, I think, you know, another interesting development, right, is that people with experience with unions um, could tell you how union corruption happens, just like political corruption or economic corruption or educational corruption. Um, but I think this, for the person who has had it or would they get away with the funds, that's called forensic accounting. Uh, and you might be interested in that as a career. Uh, if you're asking that question, it means you're already kind of thinking about that. And there is a well-paid job, uh, again, called forensic accounting. Um, I think, you know, you've got some interesting ideas about thieves. Um, I would look up the Pink Panthers uh, and think about the Kim Kardashian diamond case uh, in Los Angeles and think about how thieves and why thieves get away with things and then why there's no honor among thieves. Uh, in other words, why thieves tend to steal from one another. Uh, and I am kind of implying that Kardashian is a thief. Uh, I feel this is something that's seen throughout history. Um, and they bring up two historical examples, Black Panther movement, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I think, yes, uh, people organizing for popular justice uh, usually do this in these ways. Um, and I think this person is right. Historically, if we look at revolutions, they do tend to happen when there is a large division between the people who own property, and I don't mean a house, that's you own debt if you own a house, uh, but people who own, you know, like Trump Tower, um, or people who own, um, you know, New York Times building, right? That th Those people have, from the things I've seen, right, one one percent uh, of the population owns 90 something percent of the wealth, right? Uh, when you see those kind of divisions where there's so, you know, the, the distance between the poorest and the richest uh, throughout the last 2000 years of recorded Western history, uh, though that's a recipe for disaster. That's usually when violent revolutions occur, uh, which seems to be where we're at in this society. Uh, I just wanted to show you this slide because you have a lot of questions. So I am going to go through those uh, and see what I can find out. Um, and I encourage you to do the same thing. Uh, some of you are confused. So I do love this idea when a student tries to um, help you not be confused. So I would definitely use that approach as much as possible. If you think you know something, definitely uh, share the information. Um, but again, like sometimes confusion is like just you sorting out how you feel about it uh, and answering um, some difficult uh, questions like, you know, clarified politically when, when philosophers and, and legal scholars are using the concept of politics, uh, th they start with the assumption that Thomas Hobbes started with, which is that we're in a state of violence. And so war is uh, the natural state of things and politics is another way of conducting war. Uh, and so politics clarifies who the enemies are uh, and, you know, there, there's then that creates a process. Uh, so, um, you know, I think sometimes when you're critical, it's because you don't necessarily understand what the author is saying. And so I think that's where the term confusion is helpful for me to see how you're trying to understand the concepts and how I can kind of help you uh, better understand how to think about the reading. So then I looked at the discussion board posts. Uh, and I showed, you know, just a couple examples here, but, you know, a lot of you, most of you used um, movies and TV shows. So I want you to think about that. So much of your examples came from that's your legal knowledge is based on movies and TV shows. So who who writes that narrative? Whose story does that reflect? Uh, a few of you used uh, cases or stories from the news. Uh, and a couple of you used examples from your personal life. Uh, so we've got three different narrative uh, types. Uh, and I guess four if you include television, right? Um, so just something to think about already with the polyvocality of legality narratives is that they have different sources of knowledge. 
So again, I'm reminding you polyvocality, uh, legality narratives, and what you have shown through your own work is a fact that there are more than courts. Courts are not the only place that Americans uh, and all human beings can go to resolve their conflicts. And in fact, conflict resolution in families and communities is common. They, most of the time, people don't go to court, in fact. Uh, and on top of that, uh, of the, the crimes of criminal court, over 90% of those cases never go to court. Uh, they are gone through the plea bargain process. And so uh, that's another form of alternative dispute resolution. I put, here's what AI has to say uh, about what you are talking about. Um, these are the concepts that you tended to focus on as a class. Uh, so you talked a lot about power, uh, justice, the courts, conflict were kind of equal to each other, resolutions, uh, people, family, disputes, approaches to those disputes. Uh, you talked a lot about movies, as I said. Um, you didn't, less, you know, you talked more about authority than you did about law. Uh, you brought up several examples of mediation, usually between family members uh, and sexual partners. Um, and so this is kind of like your knowledge base on how you're understanding the material so far. So I'm going to get to what this all means in a second, but let's look at just the nouns. Uh, you tend to use justice as a noun uh, as opposed to a verb like doing justice. So you see justice as a thing. Uh, you tend to talk about conflict as a thing. You talk about people as a thing. Uh, you even talk about the approach uh, to things as a thing. Courts as a thing. Law is a thing. Resolution is a thing. Characters are things. Process are things, right? So <laughs> you see what's going on here um, is you tend to see these as things. I think you tend to see them as one of two things, uh, location, a place, uh, or you tend to see them as very abstract things, uh, almost as things that represent some other thing. Uh, the verbs you use uh, are tending to be in two categories. Uh, either they're very active, like taking, resolving, emphasizes, agree, involving, highlights, uh, or they're more, um, I don't want to say spiritual, but they're more uh, uh, thought-based, right? Believing, finding, watching, right? More sensory-based, perception, based on perception. Uh, when I put all together, uh, you are using these phrases uh, most often. Uh, and again, the larger numbers are the larger numbers. The larger words are those that are used by more of the students. Um, and so you all do have a fairly uh, uh, similar view of the legal system, the judiciary, based on the discussion board assignment and the reading, and of course, all your pre-existing knowledge that you bring into the classroom. Um, and for some of you, you might get closer to the screen and start looking at these outer margins and see if those are words that you tend to use uh, and start helping us uh, understand why you chose to use those words as opposed to the more common narrative that you see here in the middle. So I wonder, do you expect courts, and many of you forgot that there are judges in courts, but let's put them together. Do you expect judges to resolve conflicts that begin in families and communities? Um, so again, let's see what AI had to say in their summary, uh, and because it's a nice little story, I'm going to read it out loud. Uh, the most common ADR, which is alternative dispute resolution methods, are negotiation, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, and private judging. Negotiation involves setting out what each party wants in order to reach an agreement. Conciliation involves a third party assisting the parties in reaching a decision but without making the decision themselves. Mediation is similar to the conciliation, but the mediator exercises issues that influence over the outcome. Arbitration involves a third party making a binding decision on the dispute. Private judging involves hiring a private judge to hear the case and make a decision. I'm going to let you read the rest uh, as I think I have demonstrated the difference uh, between when you copy and paste from the internet and when you give me your own ideas, which then come out in the examples. So thank you again, and I hope that this has been helpful.